So for, uh, for tonight, uh, we have six retro candidates. All six will be participating. All questions asked of the candidates need to be directed to all six candidates. You cannot ask a question of a single candidate. So yes, the, uh, the process for asking questions is going to be, we have an area over here where you'll be able to come and write your question down and submit it to either Patrick or myself. We will then be ordering questions and calling you up one at a time to ask your question at an appropriate time. So we ask that when you come up to submit a question, you wait here and uh, members of the Commission of Internal Affairs staff will be organizing asking of questions. Each candidate will have a three minute opening and closing. Each candidate receives two minutes to respond to each question. Candidates also have two rebuttal cards, which they may use um, as a rebuttal to any other candidate's response or the question. Uh, and that rebuttal time is 45 seconds. If you'd like to ask a question, there's paper up front. We um, are screening all the questions before they're asked just to ensure appropriateness and relevance. Uh, so you can grab a piece of paper at the table up here to my left, uh, write it down, show it to either Eric or I. Uh, we'll say, it's good to go. And then just line up at the microphone right to my left and you can ask your question through that. So with that, we'll begin. So each candidate has three minutes for an opening, beginning with Mr. Myers. Mr. Myers. Good evening. Thank you in advance to everyone for coming out. The position of Queen's Rector requires experience. Experience with the Queen's community. I started here at Queen's back in 2004 and completed a full four-year undergrad degree, and now I'm back for law school. I've been through everything that all of you are going to go through or have gone through. Be it issues with the administration, issues with housing out here in the local Queen's community, including things like garbage collection, and concerns you're going to have about finding work once you leave Queen's. Broader picture experience. I did my second degree at York University. That gives me a lot of perspective on the things we don't want to have happen here at Queen's and maybe one or two things we would like to bring to Queen's, particularly a Yogan Fruz for downstairs food area. But most of all, the experience requires professionalism. Student issues are taking a back seat when the Board of Trustees meet. The reason for this is they're not taking our representatives seriously. I'm sure many of you have seen the emails that were sent out to the past rector and how little respect was shown for the lead representative of student issues. Though towards the end, I imagine most Queen students weren't showing that either. We need to bring professionalism back to this position. We need to put a serious face on our representative dealing with the highest issues that we are going to face here as Queen students. My professional experience beyond just law school includes working at an accounting firm, a downtown Toronto law firm, and being a member of the board of directors for the Thornhill Soccer Club, where we reach out to at-risk kids, as well as just serving the community in general. On October, 20, on October 25th and 26th, I'm asking students to choose the candidate who is going to best be able to advocate for their issues. I'm asking you to help me restore accountability to the rector's office, restore quality to this university, to restore the community's health, safety, and respect within the greater Kingston area. And so I ask you to help me become Queen's next rector. My name is David Myers. Thank you for listening.
Next is Asad Chisti, Mr. Chisti. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Asad Chisti, A-S-A-D. It's a sad name. Pun. I'm running, I'm standing here before you, I'm running to be the next Queen's Rector and I'm here to engage with you, I'm here to communicate with you, to communicate for you, to the admin, and I'm here for change. Uh, I, think, I think a growing sense of one-way communication has been going on between the administration and the students and I'm here to change that. I'm a second year engineering student. So I, I just stopped being a fresh frosh a few months ago and I'm excited to be here and yes, enjoy the debates. That's is Robin Lyon, Ms. Lyon. Can everyone hear me? We're good. Okay, so my name is Robin Lang. I'm running to be rector. Neither of them said kind of what the position is, so hopefully you all know if you're here, but essentially it's the third highest officer of the university, so it represents undergrad students, grad students, and professional students of the administration. So it's a really important position, and I really hope that all of you come out and vote, because the higher bonus we're going to have, the better, um, more serious the position will be taken with the administration. So the reason that I'm running is because my experience, previous experiences have led me to this point. I believe that the rector position um, is really defined by the individual that's in the position, and I think it's up to whoever is rector here to decide how they're gonna go forward with that. And how I'm gonna go forward with it is in the sense that I have previous experience and I'm gonna use that to move forward with it. So I, last year I was the vice president of the Arts and Science Undergraduate Society, so it's the um, ASSIS, the organization that represents all arts and science students. And there I had a lot of different experiences with the administration um, and with running a budget that was close to a million dollars. And that gave me a lot of insight into the internal structures of the administration and how to really get things done and what channels to go through to really enact change. And it also got me involved with a lot of different things like the academic plan um, that are going on and realizing that students really do have an impact here and we really do shape Queens. And especially with the turnover in the senior administration right now that's happening, it's really important that we have a rector that knows that history and that pushes it forward with this new administration. I think that we have a lot of opportunities in the coming years. We do have budget cuts, but I think that those are that it's a really great opportunity for us to rethink the way that we do things while maintaining our history as well. So essentially, I'm running because I think I have substantial experience with this position. I never planned on being here, but it's just been, I've been led to this point. I just finished my undergrad degree here in environmental biology. Now I'm starting my master's program, so this will be my fifth year, and I don't plan on going anywhere soon. So uh, October 25th and 26th is when you guys vote. I hope you uh, engage in discussion with us tonight. Thanks. Next up is Mike Cannon, Mr. Cannon. Uh, hey guys, uh, my name's uh, Mike Cannon. I'm a fourth year applied economics student here at Queens. Um, I guess I'm gonna start with my, my experiences here because that may come up uh, or may not come up in the debate. Um, so uh, I guess it started back in virtual when I really got involved, got involved in QMP and I became deputy leader eventually and that's kind of what got me into the whole politics thing here at Queens. Um, I, last year I uh, was an access rep to the AMS so I uh, had a vote on both the access assembly and the AMS assembly. Um, but furthermore, I was, uh, I was working with the admin. I got the chance to work with the administration on the Committee on Student Hazardous Activities and Risk Management, uh, which AMS uh, voted me to. Um, I, uh, yeah, all right, so now for my platform. Um, if there's one priority I have, or my biggest priority, it's uh, mental health. Um, I feel like the resources here on campus need to be increased. Whether the resources are uh, more psychiatrists, counselors, uh, physical space to hold the counselors, um, or with education, uh, bring down the stigma, and ensuring that the stigma is reduced, uh, basically to zero, if, if we can get that far. Um, and uh, ensuring that the students on this campus get the mental health resources that they, they require. Uh, furthermore, I want a visible rector. I want a rector that uh, students can recognize, someone who they know the name of. And I think the best way to do that is to have a rector that goes out to the campus, uh, puts boots on the ground, and essentially interacts with students on a regular basis. Uh, so if that's going out to support the charity causes, uh, to support the sports teams, uh, or other extracurricular activities such as plays, uh, that's what it takes. Um, having a united campus is also important to me. So having a rector who can, uh, can unite the campus, uh, someone who can mediate for uh, the AMS, uh, the SGPS, uh, or other parties on campus who are asking for it. Uh, communication is also important to me, so having a rector that communicates. 
Um, I mean, that means that means more than just having a, a open door policy. That means more than having a website. That means more than labeling the director's uh, door. But it starts with that. But it literally goes out, or it, it finishes with going out and talking to the students and, and meeting them in their uh, in BioSci and Matt Quarry uh, here at uh, Cobro. Um, the last one is the accessibility administration. I feel like the administration. Um, often releases lengthy reports, um, and that's just the nature of the administration. That's what happens um, in, in a school's administration. Um, and they answer feedback from students, but it's not always easy to get because the documents are 22 pages. They are 30 pages. They're 50, 100 pages long. And so I think it's up to the rector to, uh, to bring that down to one page that seems some of the biggest issues that they're facing. Thanks, guys. Next is Nick Francis. Mr. Francis. Hi there, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for coming out to the debates. Uh, I look forward to answering some questions tonight. So my story uh, is a longer story. I'll try and keep it brief. Um, but leading up to this point, there have been a lot of major um, events that have happened in my life. It started when I was in my first high school, where I had faculty and students who really didn't care about their education. Um, and that influenced me in a big way. And it left me not caring about my education. And then I changed schools, and uh, the faculty and the students there, they cared a lot about their education. It inspired me. It inspired me so much that I actually had a goal to go to university. I um, mean, Queens was my number one school to go to. Uh, so I've been really happy to be here, and once I got here, um, I was just looking everywhere, somewhere to get involved. It wasn't until halfway through the year, I met some student leaders who were willing to take the time to listen to me and my concerns that I had about an event during Frosh Week. Um, and they actually listened to me at an informal event, even though I was just a first year with no title, no experience, no nothing. Uh, they gave me a couple hours the next day, and they actually introduced me to the role of the rector. So in my first year, I ran for that position, and I learned many, many things in that time. I got a great experience, um, and it's led up to this point. Since then, um, the network that I built and all the different uh, things I was told when I was running, I've kind of taken heed of those and actually went out and done research before this coming campaign. Something that came to me is a vision for Queens, and I think it's very important for the rector to actually have a vision for the school. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna enlighten you guys on my vision for Queens University. So essentially the way I see it is that Queens students were very involved, were very engaged, uh, and we make the school a top university. My mom was the one who actually asked me a couple weeks ago, why is Queens a top university? It ranks 144th um, on the world, UK, world university rankings. And my answer to her was, it's the students. The students are engaged, even if the, in the classroom, they don't get enough uh, engagement. It looks like, uh, sorry, you look at somebody like John Stackhouse, editor-in-chief of the Globe and Mail. Uh, he went here in 1971, he graduated an arts degree. Uh, there was no journalism program offered to him. However, he was the editor-in-chief of the journal. That's one alumni story where, uh, and there are many more of students who were engaged outside the classroom. And I think right now, the quality of our education and the quality of the services that are provided by the university do not reflect that of the needs of the students that go here. So one of the things I want to do is motivate the change and direct the university administration towards raising the quality of the services and the education, obviously with financial restrictions in mind, which means that we need to get the students involved. I have many different uh, mediums and venues of, of which I want to do that. And I encourage you to visit my website, votefrancis.com. And again, I look forward to uh, answering some questions tonight. Thank you very much. Next is Laura Stairs. Ms. Stairs. Last year, I came to the understanding that student elected positions are really only effective when the students trust their representative. I think the first step in establishing uh, a trusting relationship is honesty. I think in order to have, uh, to, to sort of gain, in order to be honest, um, we really need to be open and transparent about our biases and our opinions. Keeping this in mind, I created a platform that would show students exactly who I am and what I stand for. My past engagement with students at Queen's uh, has allowed me to address issues that I think are important to all students and outline exactly how I think the rector should be addressing them. These ideas that I've come up with are not 
necessarily mine alone. They have been the, um, uh, so they are the result of my listening to and engaging with students, student associations, faculty, and staff. Uh, being elected rector does not necessarily make somebody a leader. I think a student should be elected the rector because they already are a leader. So throughout this past year, I was committed to advocating for students on financial accessibility at this school. Um, I began working with the, sorry. <laughs> so I started by just researching and looking into the new tuition payment system at our school. Uh, after I had learned about it, I started engaging with other students. We came up with a list of concerns that we then brought to the Registrar of the University. When it became apparent that our actions as students at large were not really being taken seriously, we started working with the AMS and faculty societies to present a unified student voice to the administration. If elected rector, I will employ the same framework when coming up when other issues come up. Uh, so that means that I'm going to start by researching and learning about the issue so that I can uh, have a, as full an understanding of it as possible. At that point, I'll take it to the students. I'll ask them for their feedback. Um, we'll come up with a list of concerns together and then also a list of ideas for improvement. Finally, I'll work collaboratively with the student associations uh, to prevent a, to, oh, sorry. Oh, to present a unified student voice to the students. So, I have already proven myself capable of following through on these three steps. If I'm elected rector, I will commit to doing this on every single issue that comes up. Thank you. We'll begin with the question period. If anyone would like a question, you're welcome to come up. Um, just to the table up here, we'll screen your question and then you can Ask it from the microphone. Patrick, we have a quick question. Uh, who starts off the questions? Uh, Is it back to Mr. Myers? It will be uh, Assad. Assad, okay. Yes. And moving to Assad's left. So the first question is, what is the greatest issue facing Queen's students? Hello again. Um, the greatest issue facing Queen's students right now is the barrier that exists between the administration and the students. Uh, the administration doesn't so much talk to the students as much as they talk at the students. And, and that's, that's unfortunate. A lot of, when you come to university, it's all too easy to be lost. And it's unfortunate. I think it's okay to be lost. But it's not okay to have to run around in circles before you're able to find a guide before you're able to find someone who helps you navigate through all the red tape, uh, who lets you know where you can go, uh, who lets you, you know, who helps you with nudging the people that, that should be helping you out, but because of the barrier, are unable to. So the biggest issue right now facing students is communication. Thank you. question um, asked me throughout the campaign period and I don't think that there's any one answer I can give because I think that the most important to issue to students depends on who you ask. To me, mental health resources might be the most important thing right now. To other students, financial accessibility to education may be the most important. So I don't think that the rector should come in with any preconceived ideas of what is most important. That's personally my stance. Um, I think that the rector should be there to listen to these important issues and advocate on behalf of all of them and which ones that students are communicating to you most frequently. I don't think that you should try and focus on one particular issue to the discredit of another. And I think that that is a position that the rector can actually do, is act as a liaison between different committees and different groups that have these important issues um, and make sure that each issue is given its due attention. So I don't think that there's any one particular issue, but I do think that there's a lot of issues uh, within the coming year that the rector can definitely be an advocate for. Um, I, I'm going with Robin. So I think there's there's multiple types of issues uh, facing these students. I think the biggest one uh, that is facing these students is probably the quality of their education. Um, how much quality they get for every dollar they spend on tuition. Now that said, uh, I feel like that's being 
that's being addressed very well. Uh, it, maybe not very well, but it, it's being addressed and it's being acknowledged by the administration. So I think that the biggest issue perhaps the rector should be dealing with is mental health. Um, it's the one that, that's a little bit newer that um, there's not enough research on for our age group that we're, uh, we need more evidence-based research here. Um, so I would go with mental health. Um, not because it's the biggest issue, but it's because it's the biggest issue not being fully addressed. All right, so I would agree with the uh, other candidates in saying that there is no uh, one issue that you can define as the greatest issue that affects Queen students. Um, but I do think that the quality of education and the quality of the services are the two main issues for sure. Um, for services, mental health uh, has seen significant improvements, and that's great. Um, and it's become a priority because of last year's tragedies. Uh, and that's unfortunate. It should have been reviewed long before that. Um, and I think now we need to start looking at all the other services as well um, and do a review of those uh, as well as to make, and the rector should uh, be someone to continue uh, keeping mental health as a priority as well as prioritizing other services. And then with quality of education, uh, it comes down to a much larger complex issue uh, and the rector really needs to find a way to involve students and inform students on how they can uh, play a role in the changing atmosphere of our academics. Uh, for example, the academic plan, a lot of students don't know about the academic plan. Uh, the rector can be someone to inform students on that and show them how they can get involved with it because it is going to change how we learn and how they teach at Queen's University for the foreseeable future. Thank you. also agree that we can't necessarily uh, pick out one issue as being more th important than another. Um, but unlike the other candidates, the reason that I think this is because we can't be talking about um, like quality of our education without talking about finances at the same time. And we can't be talking about mental health without talking about equity and diversity. Um, we can't be talking about sustainability without talking about finances. We can't be talking about alumni relations without talking about the quality of our education, about equity and diversity. All of these things need to be talked about at the same time and all together. So that is something that I'm committed to doing. I've outlined six different things in my platform that I think are really important. I don't think these are the only important things. They're just the things that I uh, chose to address at this time. And I don't think that we can have a conversation about any one of them without talking about all of them. So I'm committed to uh, prioritizing every single one of them and all in relation to one another. Makes a long trek back across the candidates' tables. The greatest issue that we face here at Queen's is the one that got me involved in running for rector in the first place. Quit fussing with the volume, whoever that is. <clears throat> There's a decline in quality here at Queen's. I noticed it when I came back here after having done a degree at York and realized that for some ridiculously strange reason, we were trying to be more like that university that I didn't come from but fled. The first year geography students haven't just lost the professor in their classroom, they've lost the classroom. They sit at home and they take their lecture from a glorified, overpriced YouTube account. This summer, things got so bad in the politics department that a number of them approached me and asked me to advocate on their behalf with the head of the politics department. There were issues with their sign up for Solus, but most of all, there's been a reduction in the number of classes available. More than that, there's been a reduction in the number of third year classes third year students are allowed to take. They're being made to take more second year courses for their degree instead of third year classes because it's cheaper. As rector, I would be sitting on the finance committee and would do my best to fight to bring quality back to the classroom and to stop dramatic cuts like this before it gets any worse. We don't want to be replacing in class time with a professor for online time with a YouTube account. It's one thing to augment our education using technology, but we can't replace it. Thank you.
just like to remind everyone to hold your applause until the end of each set of questions, um, just for uh, time efficiency. Uh, so our next question comes from the floor. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kate Irwin, and my question is, can you please state your plan to assist students with invisible disabilities on campus? Specifically, Begin. invisible disabilities. Beginning with Ms. Lyon. Thanks for the question. Um, I think that part of doing this is working with pre-existing services, and being really being out on campus and going and talking to different groups while utilizing the organizations that we already have in place. So going through things like the AMS and their clubs and their pre-existing organizations, I think is really important because they've already, they are already established and not a lot of people know about the rector position. So as much as I think the rectors should be a resource in this regard, I don't think they should tackle it by themselves. I think that they really need to use pre-existing organizations and ask them how they've been addressing it and how they can move forward with that. But in terms of specific ideas right now, I'm not sure other than utilizing that. Okay, um, I think it's education. Uh, I think just educating people, um, and that sounds kind of cheesy, but um, I feel like the professor-student relationship, for example, I think that if our professors understood the uh, invisible disabilities and, and perhaps the amount of effort that comes in, and takes out to come to your professor and say you have one, um, that they'd be more understanding, and that they, they become aware of how much effort that takes to say, and so that when you do say it, that they can respond appropriately. And I think basically getting training for anyone who interacts with students on this campus uh, on a regular basis is important. Um, but that said, we also need to compete with amongst the students. Um, so uh, it's basically education, um, but both on both levels, the administration and the professors uh, who interact with students and amongst the students themselves. All right, thanks for the question. Uh, I think to answer this, uh, basically the, what the rector would have to do, uh, or what I would do as rector, is to approach existing networks as Robin said, uh, because obviously with talking with students, you can't talk to all 22,000 students every single day and find out exactly what issues there are. So to rely on those existing networks and find out who these students are or if they're part of these groups, um, and if they're not, then that's an issue that will be dealt with situation, uh, as a situational issue. Um, and I think the rector just needs to be in touch with as many different um, student groups and uh, student networks that there are with the AMS and faculty societies. Uh, the rector should stay in touch with different student leaders uh, to see what they're up to and then see how they can um, provide resources uh, to those, those leaders and those groups that are trying to um, provide a better experience for people with invisible uh, disabilities. Thank you, Kate. Um, so I'm definitely not an expert on this issue. However, I read through the 2011 ac uh, accessibility plan for the university and did notice that a lot of what they were addressing were for physical disabilities. And we know that there are students at this school who that doesn't necessarily, that is, that's not their only, uh, that's not their only ability issue. Um, so what I would like to see is the rector to be working with the HRO, um, Heidi Penning, who is amazing, is doing lots of wonderful things. They have so many ideas, and what we need to be doing um, as a rector is not necessarily to be coming up with our own ideas or to be um, you know, doing anything on our own, but rather being a voice in support of what the HRO is already doing. I also think it's important to be working with student groups who are already dealing with this. So for instance, we have Queen's Invisibilities and they run uh, an amazing um, awareness week that I think the rector could do a lot to support. So that could mean like using your uh, website to advertise things for them and just, uh, you know, actually just being present at those events and learning about it yourself. Like let's just go out, attend those events, see what's up, see what ideas they have, and then try and work to implement those in our university. I was actually just speaking with Gail Eaton-Smith from the Disability Services offices yesterday. 
She was telling me about how bad it's getting there. They've been having to cut 4% a year for several years now off their budget. It's gotten so bad they're trying to automate everywhere they can and people who are usually there as disability and learning strategists are being forced into more administrative roles because they simply don't have the time to accommodate all the students. As a rector, I would be pushing to stop these cuts by seeking out alternative sources for revenue. Specifically, we need to start tapping the alumni again. There's been a decline in alumni donations over the past few years due to issues in part with the rector's office. Okay. Due in part to the issues with the rector's office, but also events surrounding Aberdeen that have since been remedied. We need to reach out to former Queen students once again. The rector can also act as an advocate. The rector can also act as a fundraiser from government sources. We need to be out there lobbying for greater money to come in from those who we are helping to elect here. Politicians are making it in off the backs of Queen students, but we're not seeing any greater allocation of funds for our issues. Furthermore, I would seek to raise greater awareness about the existing bursaries on campus for persons with disabilities, visible and invisible. There's actually a great many of them out there, but they're not necessarily well advertised enough for people to know about them. We need to fix that so that they can have greater access to tools that can help them accommodate these disabilities, and they can do just as well as anybody else here at the university. Thank you. Excellent question, Ms. Erwin. Uh, in, in previous years, the rector has taken on a lobbyist position, and uh, wow, I, I think I finally found my feet here. Uh, it's a little intimidating, all of you looking here, and the light's shining right in my eyes. Uh, but I think I'm ready now. Um, in previous years, the rector has taken a position as a lobbyist, and they have supported uh, certain causes. So what, what would be an approach would be to ask why these issues aren't being talked about. You know, talk about stigma, talk about these problems. Especially at an institution that's as old as Queens, we tend, to overlook, we tend to overlook new stuff because we've been dealing with old stuff, and that's on our agenda. Um, what I'd really like to bring to this issue as rector would be some humility. This problem exists from the grassroots up. You know, you work with the admin and you go down, sure. But I'd much rather work with uh, a group like Res Life. You know, work with the Dons. Um, you know, bring greater awareness from the get-go when the frosh are coming in uh, and, and they're talking about these issues, they're talking about these invisibilities. And that's how I would tackle the problem. I'd bring some humility and say, we've got the Dons. They, they communicate with these students on a regular basis from the get-go. We can, we can bring these issues to the forefront right from the beginning, right from their first day here. Thank you. The next question will be from the floor and the first speaker will be Mr. Tanner. Hi, um, so my question is, how will you facilitate feedback from students and how will you communicate important administrative decisions? If you could all please comment specifically on concrete plans and strategies that you have in mind and resources that you would take advantage of. Um, well, I think the first thing is getting a rector website back on the right. I mean, that's just the basics. Right now, queensu.ca slash rector does not exist. So you go to the 404 error page, I believe. Um, so getting a rector website up that exists is, is a great, it's the start. Um, I think the second thing is uh, harnessing social media where it is, so Twitter, Facebook. Uh, I really like Principal Wolf. He's, he set a good model for connecting with students. Um, so I think meeting students where they are and not forcing students to come to you is, is the way to do it. And so that means going on Facebook and doing it, going on Twitter and doing it, um, doing a video blog, uh, and things like that. All right, so thank you for the question. So, when I first thought about how to get student feedback, uh, when I was thinking about running for this, this position again, I thought, well, let's hold town hall meetings, and I'll go out and I'll talk to as many students as I can, and hang out in Cogrove or go to Stauffer. Um, and then I realized that some of those things may be a little bit unrealistic. How many students are going to show up to a town hall meeting, I thought. So, I did some research, and I tried an experiment, and I started a Facebook group called Share Your Soul's Experience. Uh, which I'm not sure if anyone has been on it. But 
Uh, I got about around 30 responses from students that were very thoughtful um, about how their experience with Solus was either positive or negative. And I was actually able to take that to uh, the uh, university registrar, so Joanne Brady and Teresa Elm. And uh, they had actually already heard about the Facebook group. And they were very excited that students actually took the time to write real responses that were thoughtful about their experience with Solus. And I told them, you know what, I could compile this document with the responses, give this to you, um, and you guys can do what you want with it. So that was one example. They actually did take it to an internal meeting. I believe they actually took it today. So that was some student voices that actually already have been heard. Um, and that was given to some of the VPs as well as uh, the, the people who code Solus. Um, but there are many other ways to, uh, to, to gauge student, uh, student feedback. Uh, the website is another thing. I know that's a lot more technology, but my current campaign website is a model for what the new Rector website would be. Um, and there is different ways for students to uh, interact on there. As well as, again, use, utilizing existing networks. Um, the Rector can, uh, you know, communicate with the uh, commission of the AMS to, like, for example, the uh, Environmental Commission to create an event and actually get the message out to a lot of the students who are signed up with the, uh, with the Environmental Commission. Uh, that way you reach out to those students who actually really care about those issues and are willing to uh, take the time to sign up for this. Thank you. Okay. So I think communication is one of the most important roles of the rector. I mean, you have to be somebody who is capable of not only telling students what you're up to so they can hold you accountable, but also telling students what the administration is doing so that we know how to respond to that. Uh, so, I mean, a couple of things obviously have already been mentioned. It's important to be present on social media. That's where the students are these days. Um, website, obvious. Uh, something that could be included on that website would be uh, the possibility of subscribing to uh, a director's list listserv. So creating an actual listserv for people who are interested in what's going on at the university. Um, I, I can understand that uh, a lot of students might not attend town hall meetings. Uh, they might not be willing to show up. But I still think it's important to provide that as a forum for students. There are students who are engaged at this school. I went to a lot of town halls last year. I know that there are students who show up and who care, and I think their voices deserve to be heard, so I think the rector should be employing that mechanism. Um, another important thing, in my opinion, would actually be uh, going to council, going to assembly, going to faculty society meetings, um, presenting discussion questions, being like, hey, this is happening. What do all of you people at this table think? What are your, you know, what are you doing to represent the students that elected you here to talk about this issue? Um, and then also, all of the faculty societies have their own ways of disseminating information to their students, so it's important to also tap into those resources. Um, so, you know, attending, say, Art Sci Assembly, and then they can take it, and they can take it down to the DSC level, and then the DSC levels can take it down to the students who are in those departments. So utilizing those forms that are already in place. Finally, I want to mention the Principal's Mental Health Commission. Um, at the moment, they are taking student feedback on, uh, on what we should be doing about mental health at this school. I think we need to think about instances like this and how we actually are expecting students to get feedback. Uh, so, okay, They're, not all students are going to be comfortable giving a presentation. We need to have like multiple ways for students to get feedback on each issue. Thank you, Ms. Stairs. Making the rector more accessible to students for feedback is something I've given a lot of thought to. And I figured one of the easiest ways to do it would be one, make the website easier to find. And then I thought, why not incorporate that as part of the campaign? So I registered queensrector.ca. Easy for students to find. They can get to it just, uh, they can get to it right away. And on it, there are places where they can submit questions directly to me. If I were made rector, I would keep that around. Students should be able to have direct access to their representative. I've also included a full disclosure page. This is to promote transparency. I think students are interested in what the rector's doing, but they don't want to have to dig deep as investigators in order to find it. They shouldn't have to either. It should be out in the open for them. So that's how I plan to do it, simply through this website using, thank you, using that alone. 
Another way, attending meetings, specifically with the AMS, the SGPS, NSOC, ASSIS, FEXA, LSS, and a host of others here at the university. I'm just naming off the top of my head. There need to be more frequently delivered reports. These need to be more detailed, and they need to show what the rector's actually up to. I think students will actually want to hear back from the rector when they get a better sense of what the rector is doing for them. Finally, I would strike a series of committees. These committees, which I hope to talk about more later, are part of a two-way street. They will be taking in information from various groups at our diverse campus, but they will also be able to get feedback. They will be able to deal directly they will be able to deal directly with the diverse communities here at Queens on a regular basis, thus keeping the rector in the loop and them in the loop about Thank the rector. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Thank you. Excellent question. Thank you. Um, of course, attending uh, council and council meetings and assemblies such as NSOC, such as ASSIS, such as COMSOC uh, is important, but along with that, it's also attending smaller assemblies and smaller councils which are often overlooked uh, like like the nursing science society like FIXA, which was nice enough to invite all the candidates like CISA, who'd never had anyone speak at their council before until i spoke I, until i was allowed to go on the sunday um, and it doesn't have to be just there just just go for a walk how hard is it to make a connection with the student dude you've got nice hair who's your barber dude you've got a nice mustache what's up how are midterms uh, you see someone who's slouched around the corner, talk to them, it's not that hard. It's not that hard to, to be humble, it's not that hard to approach people. Sometimes you go to these councils and assemblies and, and they're not a clear, representat clear representation of everyone who's in that. I'm here for the individuals, I'm here for you. Why? I like you and I hope you like me too, but that's not, ne that's not necessary. I'm okay with just me liking you. Um, <laughs> Being engaging, being engaging, it's just not about, it's not just about Facebook, it's not just about Twitter, it's not just about the website, it's not just about Tumblr, it's not just about, did I already say Google Plus? Uh, it's not just about Reddit, you know, it's about everything. And if your candidates are not engaging with you right now, they're not going to engage with you once they're elected. It's now or never. That's, that's what it takes. Concrete suggestions, I'm going to hang out at University and Union. I'm just going to sit there, you know, through snow and rain, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, come, come hang out. Have a seat. Let's talk. Let's chat. What's up? What's on your mind? Uh, you know, open office hours. Mike Cannon talked about having a no-door policy, perhaps. Um, that's pretty cool. I'd be up for that. You want to share a bagel with me? Let's go. Let's go have coffee. You know, it's as simple as that. Let's engage. Let's engage. Thank Why you, is there this gap? Thank you. Okay. So I think that the uh, most important way to do this is by demonstrating to students what importance their feedback has, so what impact that feedback has, because I think that that's something that's really unique at Queen's, is that our feedback does matter. I worked at the registrar's office this summer, um, which the position I got by tweeting, and they tweeted back at me. So that's just telling you how much social media de really does have an impact here, and that the university is actually looking at it. Um, but I was there, and I was communicating with students on a daily basis, and the registrar was listening. They really wanted to know what students thought of Solus, what students' problems were with Solus, and they incorporate that into what they're doing every day. And I think that that is something that you really need to communicate with students, is your voice does matter, your feedback does matter, and it's not just gonna be diluted, and it's not just gonna go nowhere. So I think that that's something that's really important to communicate to students. And then I think trying to get that feedback in a number of different ways is also important. So tell them, and then things like, for example, with the academic plan last year, um, I held a number of different town halls and I chose to make them discipline specific. So I thought that the town halls that we were having weren't that effective because they just were too grand of an idea. It was the academic plan, come to this town hall about the academic plan. You had to sit there for 20 minutes until you got to the point where you were like, oh, this is important to me. They're talking about uh, you know, transdisciplinarity. That's why I came here. So what I did is I had discipline specific meetings and then I structured them in a way that they discussed specific issues. And I also had a breakout session afterwards. So the students, we were in a round table discussion, so the students knew that they were on a level playing field with, anyone, with everyone. That you weren't just talking to someone and hoping that they'd write it down and tell someone. So I think that thinking of different ways to do that, um, to engage with students and to get their feedback, and also making it so that it's relevant to them. 
So uh, Laura mentioned listservs. I think that's great, but I think a more effective way of doing it would be having listservs for particular interests, which I think would be really good. And I think things like um, targeting different groups and their interests, so utilizing pre-existing um, bodies, like I think Nick said, to say, hey, I know that this is important to you guys. This is happening at the Thank university. You, slide. Hey, uh, the next question will be from the floor. Uh, okay. And, sorry, uh, Mr. Francis will begin. Hi, my name is Suba. Uh, I'm a main campus residence council exec, so that should tell you what I'm looking for right now. Um, over 90% of Queen's first years live in residences. Uh, residence orientation or first years non-residence orientation is the first point of contact for most incoming first years. Um, and we as residence societies and staff stay and live with residents throughout the course of the year. Yet we are one of the most ignored societies. We're bigger than NSOC, we're, we're bigger than Comstock. Um, I would argue that we're a very, very uh, important society too, but even when you guys talk about it, you don't mention us. Uh, how, if you get elected, are you planning to reach out to resident societies, resident staff, and through us, our over 3,100 residents? Because they're often ignored. Thank you. All right. uh, thank you very much for the the question. Uh, I absolutely agree with uh, with what you said. That it's, it's a very large society, um, and it does impact a lot of students. And you know what? That's that's where for undergraduates, that's where the Queen's experience starts um, in in the residence. And I think there are a lot of improvements that can be made within the residence. And I think that uh, I think the rector again needs to communicate with um, with the leaders in that society um, and see exactly what they need um, in terms of from the administration um, and help them get into the channels where they will make the most efficient changes. Uh, I think if there were specific improvements that they needed, made, uh, needed to make, uh, I think that uh, the rector should be someone that they could think of to approach uh, for their particular goals or uh, whatever it is they're trying to do. Um, but I think the best thing to do is just have the rector attend those meetings uh, and really reach out to them and let them know, hey, you know what? Uh, you guys have been ignored for some time, or maybe you, I've heard that you feel ignored by a student who came up, a, uh, a concerned student. I mean, I think this is the same for many other groups on campus, uh, including smaller faculties, uh, that often, like, th those students still matter. It gets down to the individual student. Uh, and sometimes their voice doesn't have as much weight uh, in comparison to some of the bigger uh, societies and the bigger groups on campus. Uh, so I would just reach out to them and reach out to every small faculty and, and society and group that's on campus that affects all students, including the individual student. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, Tuba. Um, I know you are very passionate about this, so I was kind of anticipating that you would ask uh, a question like this. Um, I, I think that it's true. Like, we don't really pay attention to those societies, even at assembly. Um, like, it, it's just not something that we even talk about, like residents. Uh, so something that I would be really committed to doing is obviously like attending council meetings uh, for both MCRC and the Jean Royce. Um, but another thing that I think could be really useful for the rector to do is actually hold some of their forums in residence. So uh, I happen to know that Watts and Leggett both have beautiful lobbies um, and like those could be spaces where the rector goes and says, hey, I think it's really cool that we like talk about this academic plan. This is what's going on. Like, what do you what do you want to like? What do you think about it? And just like actually using those spaces as spaces where we create discussion because uh, it's important for us to meet students where they're at, and that's where they are. Well, that's where 3,100 of them are. Uh, so I think that could be uh, a, a good way of reaching those students. I think also uh, MCRC holds a lot of really awesome events. Each uh, each house has their own like really cool events, and it would be super fun to like go and hang out with those first years and attend those events. Uh, the, the chocolate fountain that I heard over Twitter might have happened the other night. I would have enjoyed that. Um, so just actually being there and like hanging out with these first years who are really cool. So I think that's, that's how I would try and engage those students. In my campaign, this issue falls under community. We need to make first-year students feel at home. They need to feel welcome from the get-go. 
Part of that is making sure that the traditions that are so much a way of life here in Queens are easily accessible to them. Part of that has to do with me creating a traditions bank so that we can help get first year students informed and involved. More than that, issues that they face directly should be a part of the conversation. Because most students go to res in first year and then move out and then don't deal with res again, it's not something students really talk about. We talk about it in the past tense. We often forget that there are people who deal with the issues we dealt with in residence day to day. This needs to become part of the discussion once again. Otherwise, if no attention is being paid to it, students aren't going to feel involved, and then they're not going to want to get involved themselves if they just think they're going to be ignored. I want to make the discussion relevant to them. I want us to engage with MCRC, find out what some of the issues are that we're still dealing with in residences. I remember when I was working for the Enrichment Studies Unit here at Queen's University, we couldn't use, we couldn't use uh, McNeil Hall because they were in the process of gutting it and refurbishing it. This is great. We need to be, uh, we need to be making over a lot of these older residences we need to make it more welcoming for students, and we need to work with MCRC to find out where we are still deficient and where we can improve this. Thank you for your question. Excellent question, thank you. Uh, like, like David mentioned, it is about community, and it's, it's not the Spanish rap sign, a donde es la biblioteca, Usam Eliada, that one's for you. Um, it's, about, it's about community, you know, it starts, it starts there. It's not just first years we're there, their international students were there too. Uh, their upper years, although they're losing their spaces, Watts Hall used to be an upper year residence only, and now they just have one floor left. Um, how about if you elect me, I train with your staff in the summer? I'm willing to do that. How about I help out uh, on move-in day? Uh, for those of you who don't know, I love taking pictures. So I would love to take pictures on move-in day. Um, how about we have a couple of hours every month where the rector does front desk hours? Um, well, uh, sometimes when I think of the rector position, I think of someone with a massive cloak and the, you know, the door is opening, trumpets blaring, the rector has arrived! It doesn't have to be like that. You know, it's as simple as, you know, it's okay if the students don't know who the rector is. It's okay, that's okay. You know, as long as the rector starts going out and he, doesn't, he or she doesn't have to say, I'm the rector, come at me. Uh, you know, they can, they don't need a proud, they just need to go out there and get to know the students. You know, for some of you, your first experience at Leonard was, you know, maybe the urinals over flooding. Uh, you know, I just, I just came out of the, out of first year, I was in Leonard. Uh, you know, you're used to Vic, uh, Vic's, you know, Lazy Scholar and other stories. Um, so that's what I would do. I would work with you from the get-go, from training day. Thank you. Thanks, for the question. I knew you would be here. <laughs> so I think that one of the um, first things that a good rector should do is meet with MCRC, meet with all the other groups, and develop a list of what their priorities are so that when these issues come up that they know are important to the MCRC, they can say, hey, I know this is important to you and this is coming up, so what do you guys think about it? And I also think inviting MCRC to discussions to it, because I do agree that they are definitely left out of many conversations that I think they can be really relevant to. Um, one of the things I wanted to, want to do is develop committees um, that would look at specific issues and try and engage student opinion on that. And I think, think having someone from MCRC on these committees is invaluable. It really is a truly unique experience being in residence and it's something that once you've left, you kind of forget that there is a group that represents students that are in residence. And I think that they can provide really valuable feedback on these different committees to try and gain a holistic view of what every student's feeling. Not just different programs, but different living accommodations. Um, another thing that I thought uh, was, um, I think MCRC should be involved in Frost Week more visibly. Um, when I was a first year, I didn't know what MCRC was at all. Um, I had no idea. And yet I'm living with people that represent me and they are MCRC. I think that I saw it as uh, my discipline facilitator, and you know that's not the best way to think of them. So I think that if you guys are involved more visibly from Frost Week, and if the rector can play a role um, in that regard, I think that that would be really good. Um, and yeah, overall, just being aware of MCRC, I think, getting that list of priorities, making sure that you're constantly thinking about um, the truly unique experience of residents, and making sure that you're- Thank you, Ms. Lane. Yeah. 
So I think the question was basically how would you get MCR, how would you list the MCRC? Is that my understanding or is that my voice? Could you repeat the question? I, it's been six people, I apologize. I, 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 uh, I said that a lot of first years live in residence, over 90% of Queen's first years, um, and Maine Campus Residence Council has over 3,100 kids. Uh, Gene Royce has about 500, uh, five to 600 this year, um, and yet both our societies are often ignored when talked about in big conversations in student government. Um, well, I think the answer is quite simple. I think it's interaction. I, I think interacting uh, with uh, the residence councils, uh, both Maine Campus and, and Gene Royce Hall, uh, whether informally or formally, um, I think there's a, a, a side to this where you send an email and you can send documents and whatnot. But I think actually going out and talking to to the members of MCRC and Genoa Hall is, is important. And it's, it's a rather simple solution here. Um, if you don't talk and you don't interact, you won't understand the issues that each other is facing. And I think it's more than just going and saying, like, what can you get from me? I think the rector needs to go out and say, this came up recently, I think you guys will enjoy it, here's what I can do for you. We have questions from the floor again, and Ms. Stairs will start. Hello, guys. Um, so, because there are six of you, uh, your platforms do share many elements, and in the opinion of many students I've spoken to, uh, unfortunately sound largely the same. So, I'm challenging you to differentiate yourself in terms of how you will be the most able to achieve your goals, and specifically, why you personally will be the voice of students that the administration will be most likely to listen to and respect. Um, well, thank you for that question. I actually think it's uh, quite difficult. Um, okay, so what makes me different? I think to start with, I, I was a student at large last year. I didn't have a title, I didn't have a position, but I wanted to see positive change happen on this campus. I saw a problem and I wanted to address it, um, and I didn't necessarily know how to do that. So I kind of maneuvered things, looked around, tried to figure out how I was gonna do this, um, started it interacting with different groups on campus, including the AMS and different faculty societies, trying to figure out like, who do I actually need to talk to to like get this stuff done? Um, through that experience, I learned how difficult it is to be a student at large when you're trying to make these kind of like these kind of uh, these kind of actions when you're actually trying to do something. Like it can be really hard to get people to listen to you. Uh, so having that experience, I think it'll be um, it'll be helpful for students who are looking to do the same thing that I was looking to do. And I think I can be someone who they can come to and be like. This is kind of what I want to do, but I don't really know how to do it. And I can say, all right, well, I've been through this, and I think that this is a good place to start, and then you can go from here and here, and let's talk about this together and figure out the best way to get this done. Uh, so that is something that I bring to this that I think uh, some of the other candidates don't have as much experience with. In terms of being listened to, um, a lot of the things that that happened last year, a lot of the interactions that I had with administrators, even with the AMS sometimes, um, made me really angry. And I, I didn't really know what to do with that. But I think I was able to, to be diplomatic in that situation, to not, uh, to not just start yelling, to not, you know, throw water or whatever I could have done, because like that's how angry I was with what was happening. Um, but I was able to be diplomatic in that situation, to communicate, articulate clearly exactly what I thought was wrong and exactly what I wanted to see happen. Uh, I Thank think, you, Mister. So. The rector deals primarily with the board of trustees and the principal, and that's where the majority of the rector's advocacy and negotiations will take place. What differentiates me from the rest of the candidates sitting up here is my experience and professionalism. I'm the only candidate up here in a professional, gra in a professional graduate degree program. I'm the only candidate up here with experience in a professional field. I'm the only one up here who gets paid to advocate on behalf of people. And for those who might be interested for some unknown reason, my first case goes to court sometime during reading week. 
I'm the only one up here, to my knowledge, who actually and actively sits on a board. I sit on the board of directors still for the Thornhill Soccer Club and get to vote in abstentia. As far as I know, I'm the only one up here who has experienced building relationships and alliances within a professional working environment in order to get things done, to meet goals, and to see projects through to their uh, see projects through to the end. These are the things that differentiate me from the other candidates. I like to believe my platform, at least at the beginning, helped differentiate me further from the other platforms out there. I don't know anymore. I haven't been reading up on what other people are writing. But what I've been doing is pretty solid. As far as I know, I'm also the only one who's publishing a full disclosure of all receipts that I'm accumulating now. I'm not waiting until after the election to submit them. I also set up a Q&A submission page on the website. And I made the website remarkably easy for students to find, both so that they could be asking me questions, and also because it's good advertising. These are the things that differentiate me and make me the best candidate for rector. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you, Derek Dodson. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that my platform is your platform. If, if, you're, if you're on my website, bodhisattva.ca, um, and, and there's something you don't like on there, or there's something you think should be there, tell me, tell me, I'm here for you, okay? Uh, the rector position exists for the students, not the other way around. The university exists for the students, not the other way around. Um, I have very little experience. I'm the only second year candidate standing up here, and I, I think that works for me because because I don't have a lot of experience and because that I don't have as much of an agenda. I'm not biased towards, does, does NSOC represent me completely just because I'm an engineer? To a certain extent. But, uh, but does, that, does that mean that I don't care about assets? Of course not. Uh, because I was a photographer for the yearbook, because I enjoy photography, I've been part of the Comsa Frosh Week, I've been part of the Assets Frosh Week, I've been part of the Engineering Frosh Week, um, and it's just neat. And from my own personal point of view, I'd like to say that when something isn't happening, I'd like to think that we can make it happen. The Queen's Camera Club died out a couple years ago, let's make it happen. So I started it this year. I'm currently organizing the TEDx conference here at Queen's. You should all come out November 6th. Um, I understand why the importance of listening. I think that's why I can differentiate my thing. Because I'm a bit of a noob, I think it works out better. I think that's why I'm open, that's why I'm responsive. I'm willing to hear what you have to say. So tweet, Tumblr, Facebook, Google+, Plus, even Reddit. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Derek. Um, I think that, first off, I think it's good that our platforms are similar. I think it's um, kind of demonstrating that the rector position, that we all understand what the rector position is and that we're moving forward um, and that no matter who gets it, we'll, we'll have generally the same ideas for the position. Um, but I think the thing that dif differentiates me the most is my experience here, my experience at Queens. Um, I've sat on, I do sit on board of directors, actually for life, of ASSIS, which is pretty exciting. Um, but I've sat on the board of directors for last year and I'm now an ex officio member of that. So I've sat on that. I've sat on the Board of Studies where I've been able to, uh, the Board of Studies for those that don't know, it's the final appeal body in um, our, the Faculty of Arts and Science. So when students, when the Dean of Student Affairs doesn't grant the appeal, it goes to the Board of Studies. And that has given me insight into how the academic appeal process works. What considerations um, we look at when students are making an academic appeal. And uh, the emotions that students are feeling in the room is quite intense and it's really, um, I find it was I found it was a really good experience to be part of that. I've also sat on ASSIS and AMS assemblies for two years now, and I see that those actually do have a direct impact on the things that students um, do, and I know the types of policies that we can put through to really have an impact um, directly with students. I've had monthly meetings with the Dean of Arts and Science. I know administration. I've had relationships with them. They know what I stand for. They know that I'm respectful. They know that I'm a rational person that looks at all different sides of the issues that will consider both the administrative perspective and the student perspective. So um, I've worked with a three quarter million dollar budget with the Arts and Science Undergraduate Society, which I think is directly transferable over to the Board of Trustees and making sure that I communicate in a Thank way that they slide. understand.
I think the best way to get uh, my platform done is, is, I think you're right. I mean, having a good relationship with the administration, I think that's the best way to do it. Um, and what separates me uh, from the other candidates here, um, I, I, I want to say this, I'm not sure if, it, if it's true, I haven't talked to all the other candidates this in depth on a personal level, um, but I'm realistic. Um, I understand that like the administration uh, isn't out to get the students, that at the end of the day, we're here for the same goal. We're here to better Queens. Maybe we have different ways of getting there, but at the end of the day, we want a better Queens. Um, and that also means though that, that I acknowledge that we have a financial situation, that we are facing a financial constraint and that I can't just demand more money and cry when we don't get it. Because it's, it's not there, it doesn't exist, and it's not the administration's fault. Um, Prince Wolf isn't stuffing money under his mattress at home. Um, so I think being realistic, being able to compromise, um, and just acknowledging that we're on the same team um, is what's gonna, gonna get us through. Thanks for the question, Derek. Uh, so, I've heard it many, many times before from uh, past rectors and from uh, people who have had really good relations with the rector, uh, that includes administration uh, and student leaders. And they told me that the rector is uh, a position where, the, where, it's, where it is molded by the individual. Uh, so I think that even though we have similar platforms, uh, the best thing to do is get to know each one of us uh, and talk with us, engage with us, and find how each person would approach uh, different situations and different issues because I think those in themselves be very different uh, than the platforms uh, on their own. Now, I think that there needs to be a balance. Uh, that is something that I, I understand for the rector. Uh, they need to be able to engage with students and talk with students, not to students. Um, not to be a level higher than a student, but to maintain uh, that status as a student, um, but who also can exist in a professional environment um, and to build relationships with administration. For the last few months I've been meeting with administrators, I've had the chance to, uh, to, to actually start building on relationships with some administrators, uh, which is a little bit of experience that perhaps doesn't set me fr separate me from all the candidates, but a few of them at least. Uh, as well as listening to the students. Um, I think I've got pretty good listening skills, so I will do my best to listen to students all the time. Uh, and I think in terms of me personally, for this role, uh, I see it as not just something that you show up and do nine to five, this is a role that you live out. Uh, the rector can be more than just within those four walls of the office. The rector should be the rector all the time, uh, whether they're walking on campus or they see a student kind of looking around, they don't know where they're going. The rector should always be looking to help students and to hear students out on the issues or concerns they may have. Thank you. There are two rebuttals for this question. Uh, Ms. Stairs and Mr. Myers have each used a rebuttal. Ms. Stairs will start. Each candidate has 45 seconds. Okay. Uh, the first thing is something I forgot to mention, although I uh, really regret that, is that in my platform I actually addressed issues of equity and diversity, and I thought that was a glaring omission from every other platform. The other thing I wanted to say in response to David was that I actually work for the Kingston Community Roundtable on Poverty Reduction. I am one of two employees, and our our organization is there to advocate for the low-income residents of Kingston. That's my job. Um, also, I wanted to say that before that, I worked for the Department of Social Development uh, in New Brunswick, and I was working in the Social Assistance Office. And I was a student caseworker, meaning that I was actually going out and visiting uh, recipients of social assistance. And I was pretty much the only face that they ever saw from my office, and so I made it my job to advocate for those people. I went and talked to their caseworkers when stuff was going wrong. I talked to NB Housing, and I said, like, this is happening to these thank people. You, and Myers. Thank you, Mr. Myers, go ahead. It was said that we can't just simply ask the administration for money because things are tight. No, we can't ask them to just create invisible money, but we can get creative. We can ask them to find alternative ways to save. Every year, the government funds environmental projects across this province and the country at large. We can ask them to help fund some of ours. If Queens wants to set up 50 solar panels, maybe the government has 25 brand new solar panels they want to try out. We get them to do that here, we meet our environmental commitments, and we roll that money, the savings of it, back into the classroom. The rector can go and advocate and lobby. We can go to Queen's Park, pockets turned out, tin cup in hand, and say, please help us, we're hurting. 
Let's get creative. Thank you, Mr. Myers. <laughs> Mr. Myers will start the next question. The question from comes from Twitter from Sean Abraham. Do you accept that tuition will need to increase in order to maintain or improve the quality of education at Queens? Mr. Myers. We're taking questions from Twitter? Awesome, okay. How about that? No, tuition at this, at this university does not need to increase. Tuition is not the primary source of funds for this university. We take it in from various places. What we need is to remind the government that they need to get serious about us. The rector does a lot of advocacy here on campus, but most people only think about doing it where the rector is invited. I'm talking about knocking on those doors where we aren't invited, because that's where our voice needs to be heard. This past, this past election, and the one that came to us in May, Queen's students stood up, went out, voted, and made their voices heard. Representatives have their job because of us. We need to remind them of that. We need to remind them of the importance of a university education in this, ever, uh, in this economy that is growing ever more sophisticated. They need to help us out. They can't just let Queen's University, one of the premier institutions, slide and lose the quality that has long been synonymous with our name. We need to remind them who's voting them into office. We need to remind them why it's important. And we need to get them to open up their pocketbooks again because they have been getting pretty stingy over the last two decades. Thank you for the question. No, 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 no. The answer in one word is no. The government to a certain extent subsidizes our education. Uh, but I think it's, it's time the university, especially under financial constraints, starts looking at education 2.0. What is it? It's not replacing professors in classrooms, but it is supplementing your education via the variety of uh, mediums that already exist. Uh, start using Web 2.0. An excellent example would be Professor Matrix, who is just phenomenal in her Film 315 class, phenomenal with her Film 240 class. Start embracing that. Look up Khan Academy. Look up MIT's open courseware. Look at what some of the other innovative educa educators are doing. And let's start embracing this. Now, the one thing about an engineer fundamentally is you solve a problem with the resources that you have. And that's one of the, thing I, one of the things I'm learning. I'm only an engineering student. But that's what the university needs to look at. And a big thing would be priorities. Where are the admin's priorities? Uh, having talked to a lot of politics students, history students, language students, there's, there's a great sense of dissatisfaction and discontent as to why is the admin ripping up a turf and why are my classes being cut? As a policy student, why am I taking second year courses and construction's going on right next to Goods Hall? You know, how does, how do these physical constructions, where is, where is the money coming from and if it is coming, where is it going? Why isn't it ameliorating and bettering our education. No, it's about priorities. So no, the answer is no. Thank you. Okay, so in short, no, I don't think that that's the way that we need to address this issue. I think that there are a number of creative ways that we can do this, and uh, the administration is actually looking into quite a bit of them. So uh, our last principal, Tom Williams, he started a number of task force to look at different uh, things. So for example, re alternative revenue sources or the use of our physical space, things like the way we buy our goods and services. We actually were able to uh, reduce a lot of our overhead by streamlining uh, where we're getting our supplies from and going with one primary supplier. Um, as well as things like the Faculty of Applied Science has partnered with the uh, School of English to try and bring in students internationally and help them support, um, help them um, be better equipped to come here that are fully supported. And things like the Faculty of Education have partnered with St. Lawrence College to increase uh, the different number of programs. So in this case it was technological education. So I think there's a lot of different creative ways we can do it. Things like the Blythe Initiative, which is allowing students to go overseas to study. But if we do that, we need to make sure that it is accessible as well. Um, and I think that it's also important to realize that we're not alone in this. 
Um, the principal, when he released his report, he talked about Guelph as having hiring freezes. We're talking about uh, Western, which is laying off a number of their faculty and which is forcing early retirement on a lot of people. Um, so I think it's really important to realize that we aren't alone in this. Government funding used to be two-thirds of our operating budget. It is now less than 50%, and where is the slack coming? Tuition. It's almost at 50%. And I think it's also important to realize that capital projects, so like Tyndall Field and like buildings, are not coming out of that budget. We get government funding that is specifically allocated to capital funds, so sometimes uh, students are confused with that. We're not getting government funding um, for our education. It's based on growth, and I think that that's something that we need to do. We need to use our existing connections with USA, for example, with CFS, who have had um, experience with lobbying, who, has, who have had a lot of successes in the past. We need to use those um, connections to lobby the government as well as come up with creative solutions. Another simple answer, uh, no. We don't need to increase tuition if, in order to maintain or increase the quality of education here. Um, maybe I'm naive, uh, but I feel like there can be efficiencies found within this giant bureaucracy that is an administration or a university. Uh, we can innovate. And uh, for example, if there are three sections of a class, and why not have one of them on, uh, on the web if that, that demand exists within students? I know I like taking web courses. Some students don't. They can, have, they can go the other two uh, course sections. But that demand exists. And I think that that demand exists. We can respond to it. We can respond to it. And we can save money at the same time. Uh, it killed two birds with one stone, um, and save money, yeah. I... Alright, thanks for the question, Sean, on Twitter. Uh, so, no, I don't think that a tuition inc increase is uh, necessary to maintain the quality of education at Queen's. Uh, and I think Robin touched on uh, working with lobbying groups like USA and CFS uh, to maintain the tuition cap uh, that is on currently uh, is, a, is a very good idea. And I think that in terms of innovating, uh, and I know that's being thrown a lot, around a lot, and this whole new use of um, technology, virtualizing courses and blended learning, these are all great experiments, uh, but we have to remember that these are experiments, they're pilot programs. Every single program is different. Uh, what might work for a math program might not work for a politics program. Uh, and I think that for each, uh, for each program, each department, uh, they need to get together and they need to compile how uh, they feel about the academic plan uh, that was recently released um, and how they feel about the 89 recommendations and how if any of those uh, do apply or if they would work in their programs uh, and then try them out if they don't work then we need to uh, look at the academic plan again and see what sort of recommendations uh, we can put out for these specific departments. Thank you. really important question for the rector to address because tuition is literally one thing that affects every single student. We all pay it. Um, and if you read my platform, you'll see that financial accessibility is one of my uh, one of my priorities. However, the way I see it, financial accessibility isn't only about tuition. It's actually, uh, it goes all the way back to like when children are young. Um, and there's also um, a tuition, I mean, obviously is a part of it, but also the way that we pay our tuition. I mean, that's what we were talking about last year, is, is how tuition is paid and how pe students are penalized for not paying that. And I think that another part of that, of course, is financial aid. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that Queen's is a public institution, and yet, as Robin mentioned, the percentage of funding that we receive, the per the, sorry, the percentage of our budget uh, that the government covers has decreased substantially in recent years. Um, so as other candidates mentioned and is in my platform, I think it's important for the rector to use the advocating bodies that are already associated with uni this university, so that includes USA, that includes the CFS, but it also includes uh, the Council of Ontario Universities, which is the, the body that our university is um, affiliated with, because also as Robin mentioned, this is something that the administrators are concerned about as well. Um, and another thing that I want to touch on from my platform was the idea of the environmental retrofits. Retro Queens pays a lot of money, uh, millions of dollars actually, in energy each year, and that could be cut substantially if we made our buildings more environmentally friendly. Uh, so I definitely do not think that we need to raise tuition. All right, thank you. Now we have a question from the floor. Good evening, Rector candidates. I'm Irene. I'm a Master of Education candidate. And, uh, you know, there's a diversity of, uh, 
you know, candidates here, or some of you are undergraduates, graduates, professional students, graduate students. Um, so the role of a rector involves representing the interests of all students, undergraduate, graduate, and professional students. And if you're elected as rector, how do you propose to listen to and address the needs of all students? All right, so Mr. Christie will start. Thank you, Irene. Um, using media. Now, the graduate students are an interesting group because they generally don't hang out the way we do. Uh, the undergrads you can generally find hanging out at, at QP a little bit more. You can see them hanging out at Cobra a little more. Uh, and they have these hangout spots. Uh, for the graduate students in particular, they generally do not have a hangout spot because they're doing their own thing. Um, and they're a little more disconnected. So how would, how would I go about making sure I was representing all of them? Um, once again, it's not just about attending as GPS council, which I already have once last year. It's not just about, about these formal events, because it is daunting. It's daunting for an individual to say, I'm gonna step it up and I'm gonna get involved at council. You know, it's, it's about just engaging with them I know a bunch of epidemiologists just through, just through Twitter. Um, I know maybe 12 of them, all of whom are, are, are on Twitter. Just using social media, we've, we've got that now. I don't know if, if you guys know, but you know, it's out there now. Let's start using it to its full potential. Um, yeah, that, that would be my response. Using, using media to its full potential, which I know very few of us are these days. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So as you hopefully know from my introduction, I was an undergraduate here and now I'm starting my master's here. And the difference between the two is crazy. I had no idea that being a master's student would be so different than being an undergraduate student. And it's really opened up my eyes to the fact that we do have such a diverse group of students here. And you can't simply brush everyone with the same, paint everyone with the same brush. You can't assume that everyone um, is experiencing the same kind of things. And I think that that's something that's really important for the rector to realize as a representative of all students. And I think that ways um, that we can ensure that all the needs of students are being represented um, is by, one of the ways that I thought of was having committees to deal with specific issues and having representation of all different types of students on those groups themselves. I'm only one person, I can only go to so many different events and to so many different groups and talk to them, but I think that striking committees um, with the rector's office, expanding it beyond the one person that's occupies the role, I think would be really key because you can create these bodies where you're uniting different um, students representing different groups, which doesn't really happen a lot in the university. We have the AMS, we've got the SGPS, and they represent their groups, but there's not as much opportunity for liaising those two groups, and I think that the rector can play a key role in that. Um, and I think that targeting students through various mediums is also very important. And another thing I mentioned before was town halls that deal with specific issues. And on top of dealing with specific issues, I think they should be targeted to specific groups. So like I said with my academic plan, I targeted it towards dis different disciplines in the arts and science because I knew that they were experiencing different um, issues with regards to the academic plan. I think that's the same thing. So don't just have a town hall about the academic plan. Have a town hall about the academic plan, about this issue with the academic plan, and for grad students. I think it's a really good way to do that, as well as bringing it all together to get a holistic view of everything. I, uh, I think the answer is as simple as listening. Uh, I know that the undergraduate uh, uh, voice on this, this campus has a tendency to drain on other ones, certainly uh, smaller ones. And the grad students are, are uh, exist in small numbers on this campus than the undergraduate students. So I think you have to listen to the students, uh, the undergrad or sorry, graduate students, and when they do speak, you have to listen to them carefully because they have a tendency to be drowned out by the larger student voice. And going beyond that is that when you don't hear the graduate voice, making sure you go out and you find it. Um, making sure that the tyranny of the majority here doesn't rule all, knowing that minorities do exist on this campus, that they need to be listened to, and that they collectively make up a huge part of this campus. Thanks for the question, Irene. Uh, so, actually, uh, this was a, a big concern of mine going into this campaign, uh, as I dealt with this question a lot in first year, and I wondered how Rector does represent both. Uh, so I met with uh, the Dean of Graduate Studies, Brenda Browers, um, and she, we talked a lot about it, and she explained to me, and I've also talked with a lot of graduate students in the last couple weeks as well, and uh, her and those students have given me the idea that graduate students are doing their own thing, um, and they want to do their own thing. They want to be invited to uh, undergraduate experiences, 
Um, they may not always show up to them, but they still want to be invited, they still want to feel included. Um, and I think going beyond just going to the SGPS meetings, uh, from what I've heard from a number of graduate students, is that not all graduate students are as connected with the SGPS uh, as it may appear. So there's, there needs to be opportunities for graduate students to have their voice, uh, voice heard, but they need to know that the rector is someone that they can actually reach out to, reach out to and it, they can actually go and talk to. Um, and so what I think is very, a very simple but uh, maybe a very effective way of doing this is through word of mouth. And I know that sounds very abstract, but the idea that if you help one graduate student and you give them that really good experience, that personal experience, chances are they're going to go and talk to their friends. They're going to talk to their, their colleagues and they're going to talk to their friends. And once it gets around, uh, you know, then the chances of graduate students wanting to go and see what this rector is all about um, are going to be higher. And as well, I think Robin touched on most of the ideas that I was thinking about. Uh, and a lot of them are similar to undergraduates um, reaching out to undergrads. I think that media may not be the best route to reach out to graduate students as they are extremely busy. Um, but even just visiting the buildings that, that they work in uh, and just walking through uh, when you have time to thank check you, out Mr. and Francis. talk to students. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, well, while well, I think it is true that undergrad issues vary from grad student issues, I think um, they the, the issues themselves are important to both undergraduate and graduate students. So if we look at, for instance, um, having a TA in a classroom. Having a TA is obviously a benefit for undergraduate students, um, but also, I mean, it, it sorry. Um, that we, we kind of do separate issues at some times. I think there are issues that actually come together and unite students and it's important to bring them together on those issues. So for instance, having a TA. I mean, it is beneficial for undergraduates to, who have to have TAs in their classrooms who are able to do their own innovative research, who are able to talk to their students about the amazing things that they are able to learn. But if, t if uh, graduate students are spending all their time TAing and they don't have the time to research, then that's gonna have a negative effect on both them and the undergraduate students. So it's bringing both of the bodies together to have those discussions so that we know that every decision that's being made by this university is benefiting both the undergraduate and graduate students at the same time. Being able to represent both the undergraduate and graduate students as rector is actually pretty easy if you've done both. I've already done an undergraduate degree here, so I understand those issues. I'm now into my second year as a member of the SGPS while here doing my law degree. I can tell you that the concerns that graduate students have are very real, and they're actually quite diverse. Politics students are currently facing a terrible time if they're doing PhDs. Even when they finish doing their classes here, there's no tuition reduction. They're paying thousands of dollars basically for access to Stopper. At least undergraduates get to pay by the class. They're not being given anything for language training. And they have to know a second language in order to get their PhDs. And when they try to audit language classes, money's been cut so badly that they're asked to leave unless they're willing to actually pay for the class. Furthermore, they're being allocated only $500 to bring in an expert in order to question them when defending their thesis. That means they have to find someone who's somewhere in the Windsor to Montreal corridor who's an expert on whatever niche issue they're researching. What happens if your expert is in England or somewhere in the States? Even just in Buffalo, the university's not willing to pay for it. The issues are diverse and it requires a, it requires a rector who has experience in both worlds. Since the position requires you to have one foot in each, I stand here as the candidate who has had one foot in each and is well placed to represent both sets of students. I've been a member of the AMS 
and I'm currently a member of the SGPS, and I'm perfectly ready to represent both societies. Thank you. All right, so that actually marks the end of the first half of the debate. Uh, we are going to take a quick break. Um, it'll be approximately eight minutes. At that time, we will continue with the second half of the debate. So uh, we thank you for the patient wait. Uh,